Well, it's the 4th of July, and we have been looking at the book of Ephesians, and it tends, it's the 4th of July week, rather, we tend to kind of think in terms of major holidays, and I, uh, I think it's important that we kind of pay attention to what's on everyone's minds at a time like this on a holiday, whether it be Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, July 4th, week of July 4th. So I'm going to take a message today from 1 Samuel 8. We'll continue next week in the book of, of Ephesians and uh, kind of consider what God has to say about larger if, issues regarding uh, governance, regarding choices that we make, regarding choices that societies make. And that's what I want to look at this morning. That's what I want our focus to be. That's why I've chosen uh, the passage from 1 Samuel 8 this morning. I felt that it was important to look in that direction. And I want to look at God's role in Israel's government and also in our own lives and in our own society as well. And to start, I want to look at uh, 1 Samuel, chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. And we're going to read the whole chapter. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. And yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us kings to judge us like all the nations. Well, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they also are doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king and shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and all of your orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you've chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice. Make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to a city, and that's chapter 22. Well, that's quite a passage. You know, it's very interesting in our own history as a nation, there is a very famous tract that was read by many people prior to the Revolutionary War. We were in a great struggle, the people, the colonists, in the, the generation prior to 1776, 
uh, felt themselves to be oppressed. They felt that the King of England, King George, was taking advantage of them. You have the uh, whole uh, thought of taxation without representation, a lot of taking going on from the King of England. And there, of course, was the revolution that uh, was part of the founding of our nation. I think it's appropriate to look at these ideas this week. We want to revisit some things that's part of our heritage, at least those of us uh, you know, who live here, who are citizens here, and who dwell in the nation. It's important to remember these things. Now, there was a famous tract, very well known, called Common Sense. It was written by a man named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was not an evangelical Christian. But it is very interesting. I encourage you to go and read this little track. You can get it online. It's in the public domain. It means you don't have to buy it. You can pull the whole thing. It's about 37 pages long. You can pull it up uh, in a PDF on, uh, on uh, the internet. And in the, the, the pamphlet, to, uh, Common Sense, uh, Thomas Paine goes into great detail examining this passage of scripture. He spends a lot of time on it, considering what its meaning might be for the country in, in the day that he lived. He, refu he reviews the entire passage. He says two things that I think are interested, interesting. He says actually quite a, quite a bit in common sense. He says, the king is not to be trusted without being looked after, or in other words, that a thirst for absolute power is a natural disease of monarchy. And he draws that conclusion as he's looking at 1 Samuel 8. And then he goes on to say this. Where, say some, is the king of America? I tell you, friend, he reigns above. A crown, we should place a crown on the word of God, on the divine law, and understand, essentially, he was saying that that is our king, that we are a nation under divine law. That was, Tom, you can, hey, pull it up on the internet and read it for yourself. And he goes into a great deal of discussion, but I bring that up because he is specifically looking at 1 Samuel 8 and it is inspiring a lot of what he wrote and it inspired a lot of what happened in our country at this time, this very passage. Now, I want to look at a few points, not necessarily applying it to our nation or its founding. I just, just wanted to point that out to you. I want to show you several things, and I want to apply it to our personal lives, our family lives, our corporate lives, and even our national life. First of all, as we look at this passage in Samuel, God had been ruling Israel through judges. He had anointed prophets and judges, raised them up, and gave them spiritual authority to give guidance to the people. There were many judges. You look through the book of Judges, you have Deborah, you have uh, Barak, you have Jephthah, you have Gideon, you have Samson, very interesting judge among them. Uh, but he had raised these people up and God was ruling through those whom he appointed. Samuel was a judge. Samuel was called supernaturally by the Lord, anointed for his purpose. And even as a young child, the word of the Lord was put in his lips and he spent his whole life establishing peace and just, judgment and justice in the land of Israel. He had a circuit that he went, and he went throughout the country and judged the people. However, when he got old and it was time for a transition, and, and he had established really a tremendous stability, he was a great prophet, he got older and it was time for a transition, uh, something developed that I think the people had a legitimate concern about. There were the twin debilitating problems of financial corruption and nepotism in the governance of the country. He appointed his sons. They were not uh, like Samuel. They took advantage of their position and they corrupted justice in the land. And these are two intractable problems that the people see. I imagine this went on for a long time before anybody said anything about it. And then it says all of the leaders of the people came to Samuel and said, hey, there's a problem going on. 
You're getting old. It's time to transition. Your sons don't follow in your ways. What are we going to do? No, Samuel, don't tell us. We're going to tell you what we're going to do. You're going to make us a king. That's what we're going to do. They had a legitimate concern and they had legitimate standing. If anybody in Israel was going to make the choice of what needed to be done, these were the folks that needed to do it. They came and said, make us a king. This isn't working. You know, if you look at it, their concerns make a lot of sense. What they were saying makes a lot of sense completely. Thirdly, they had a legitimate request. Not only did they have a legitimate concern, not only did they have a legitimate standing, they actually had a legitimate request. There was nothing wrong on the surface regarding what they asked for. I'll tell you why. Because it is written in the Constitution of Israel that they had the prerogative to establish a king and a kingdom at some point in time. We see this clearly stated in the book of Deuteronomy 17, 14, and 15. If we'll bring that up. Moses is telling the people long before this time, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it, and you dwell in it, then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreign over you who is not, of your, not your brother. And so then uh, it goes on. That, that's, we can take that passage down. It goes on. He tells them how the king will behave. So there's, there's nothing wrong, really, with the question that has been asked. Here's what's happened. Samuel's sons are motivated by acquisition and personal gain. It becomes the ruling motive of their life. They're not hearing from God and they're not pursuing justice. Legitimate people come to Samuel and say, something's got to change. And they have the plan, they have the remedy in place. And according to the NIV Study Bible, it says the elders cite Samuel's age and the misconduct of his sons as a justification for their request for a king. And it soon becomes apparent, however, that the more basic reason for their request was a desire to be like the surrounding nations, to have a human king as a symbol of national power and unity who would lead them in battle and guarantee their security. And further, the NIV Study Bible says, the sin of Israel in requesting a king did not rest in any evil inherent in kingship itself, but in the kind of kingship the people envisioned and their reasons for requesting it. Their desire was for a form of kingship that denied their covenant relationship with the Lord who himself was pledged to be their savior and deliverer. In requesting a king like all the other nations, they broke the covenant, rejected the Lord who was their king, and forgot his constant provision for their protection that he had given them in the past. So they had a legitimate request, but it appears that they had a misguided motive. You know, you can ask the right thing for the wrong reasons. You can have a good reason for acting, but the way that you act out isn't actually in line with the way the Lord would have us to respond to a situation. And this is what's happening in Israel. So they had a misguided notion, according to Kyle and Dale, it just says God's verdict on their, uh, on their motive the verdict on the part of God refers not so much to the desire expressed as to the feeling from which it had sprung. The elders of Israel has a perfect right to present the request. The wrong was in their hearts. What was their motive? What was their goal? 
that the Lord would no longer rule over them, but a human ruler would, and they would somehow obtain or attain autonomy. They did not live in a day of patience. They lived in a day of quick fix. It was not a quick fix to this situation. And they did not patiently look to the Lord and ask the Lord for his response. And so they uh, negated the possibility of revival that God could bring to life things that were laying dormant if they would with Samuel seek the Lord for his answer. But they simply appointed the direction in their own minds and in their own hearts. And you know what's amazing about this? It says that the people got their way. The request was displeasing to the Lord, but the people got their way. That's kind of an amazing thing. Isn't it amazing that God will give us individually our way and that God will give large groups of people their way? He'll even give an entire nation its way, even if that way is not in their best interest in the big picture of things. In fact, it's not in their best interest, but their heart is set on this course of action. We saw that with the 12 spies. 10 spies said no, 2 spies said yes. The people got their way. God gives us our way. God gives us our way, and so it is incumbent upon us to see to it that the way that we want is the way that the Lord has communicated to us is best for us. Because if that doesn't happen, he may give us our way, even if it's not best for us. And it happens even on a national scale. It's unbelievable. It even happened in Israel, his own nation. It's a remarkable thing if you consider it. I remember teaching in... Eastern Europe in the days shortly after communism, I had some colleagues who wanted to make democracy safe for Eastern Europe. In other words, they want to introduce it. This wasn't something people understood or practiced. And they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to teach these people to vote on things. And uh, <laughs> one vote, you know, it just they just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. And uh, so we were voting on this, voting on that. And so one day we had a situation we had to have, we had chapel uh, several times a week and we had to have the chapel either in a very nice room that was very well appointed for the chapel or we could have the chapel in the synagogue building. And the people who were close to the situation knew like everything was set up to do this in the chapel but it in in the yeah in the chapel room but not in the synagogue but there was no real discussion there was no kind of finding out what's going on what the best they just said let's have a vote so it was about 100 people voting that they were in the in the meeting and it turned out that 80 people voted to have the meeting in the synagogue and 20 people voted to have the meeting in the chapel. So we're going to have the meetings in the, we're going to have our chapels in the synagogue rather than in the room designed for it. It was a beautiful, it's called the Red Room. Nice, nice chairs and everything in there, nice sound system, but uh, we forfeited that. We chose something different. The, we listened to the voice of the people. As I got up to leave, and you can interpret this any way you want. As I got up to leave, the president of the student body said, that's democracy for you. 80 stupid people make a decision for 20 smart people. <laughs> they weren't too impressed. But you know what? People are making decisions for us all the time. People are making decisions for you. They're making decisions for me. We're making decisions for other people. 
People made decisions for you that had huge effect on your life. Your parents made decisions for you that you had absolutely no control over. Where you live, where you would move to, what school you went to. Your spouse may be making decisions about how they want to function or not function in your home or in their marriage. You may be making decisions for your children. People in your community may be making decisions that affect you. We think we're autonomous, but we're not. We're part of a much larger organism, whether it's in church or in society or in the family. Decisions make a difference. And when groups of people make decisions, God gives you the freedom to carry out the decisions that you make. That's why it's important to remain close to the Lord and to allow Him to direct and to guide you in all of the choices that you make. Well, what we're told here is that the people got their way and the result was not good. And they realized it later. In 1 Samuel 12, verse 19 to 25, and I think I've lost my, uh, I don't know, how did I do that? There it is, right? It's hard to lose it when it's that close by. But Now, this is now, uh, Samuel's established the king. He's handing power over to Saul. And, you know, he's told them, this is going to be different than you think it is. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver. They are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people his, for his great namesake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Samuel's response to all of this is magnanimous. Magnanimous comes from two Latin words, magna animus. It means to be a big heart. It means to have a, a, a noble heart. It means to refuse to be petty. God wants his people to be magnanimous and Samuel refuses to be petty. He refuses to hold it up. But what he says is, if now, even after this situation has come about, you serve the Lord with all your heart, he will be with you. He will bless you and he will help you. But you must turn from your evil. And what we see here is that God is both demanding and gracious even when we rebel against him. God is demanding and gracious even when we rebel against him. So Samuel here shows a gospel spirit. What is a gospel spirit? A gospel spirit refuses to hold our faults against us. A gospel spirit refuses to give up on us even when we go in a direction we shouldn't go. A gospel spirit prays God's blessing on people regardless of how we have been treated. A gospel spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ on the cross who says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The gospel spirit is one that we read about earlier. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And here's my word to you. We've made lots of bad decisions along the way. You have, I have, people around us have, in our family, 
growing up, lots of bad decisions. Decisions that would not have been God's best for us. And he allowed us to go the way that we chose. But I want you to know that God is still saying to you, don't despair. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Pursue him. Yes, turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your errors. But if you will pursue him, if you will draw near to him, he will draw near to you. That is what he's saying to Israel, even after having rejected the counsel of the prophet Samuel. And I think he says that to our nation. I think he says, in spite of, in spite of many things, cling to the Lord, seek the Lord while he is near, draw near to him while he is near, that you may see his visitation of mercy upon you. Samuel has a magnanimous heart. He refuses to be petty. He is noble. And he says, God forbid that I should ever sin against you by ceasing to pray for you. God forbid that that should ever happen. That would be a sin. That's a magnanimous spirit. And that's how we should feel toward those who have injured us, those who have maybe made decisions that affected you in personal ways, even going way back, even people in your family. Pray that their hearts will be turned to the Lord. Pray that God's grace will overtake them and recover them from the error of their way. Some of you might say it seems impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. I want to encourage you, cultivate that magnanimous spirit because it is very likely to develop oppositional defiance disorder. <laughs> it's easy to do. I always thought that was a funny name. I just said, well, you know, they just ain't listening. That's the problem. <laughs> but it, I, I know it can be deeper than that. Jesus is the ultimate magnanimous spirit. And we see this in Romans 5, 8 through 11. We read portion of it earlier. Listen to this. God shows his love for you and me. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Yes, personally, we've made bad decisions, perhaps corporately, perhaps in your family, perhaps as a nation. We have made bad decisions. We worship a God who is willing to redeem all who turn to him. God is both demanding and gracious in our rebellion. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. His grace is there to the last moment. He does, though, allow us to reap what we sow. He allowed Israel to reap what it sowed. It got Saul. Saul produced a lot, introduced a lot of problems into the kingdom. He gave them some big victories. He also gave them a lot of problems. He calls us. He is gracious, but he is also demanding. He calls us to consider our ways. But he also offers us hope despite our waywardness, whether it's individual or corporate. And I think even national. He intercedes for us for a better future. He is seated at the right hand of God. Our God is seeking blessing on our behalf. 
You know, another thing we learn in this passage is that government is a, is a great servant. It's a terrible master. And what I think Samuel wanted the people to understand is that rights and blessings come from God. They are to be protected by government. They cannot be bestowed by government. But they were expecting a king to do something for them that only God could do. It wasn't wrong to set up a monarchy, but their motive in setting it up was somehow that a human system would protect that which only God can protect. A human system would guarantee that which only God can guarantee. Read Common Sense. Read Thomas Paine. If anything is clear, the founders understood that we did not worship our government. We worship God who gives just government, and we are thankful for that gift. You know... This has been known throughout the history of our nation. And I want to recommend another book. I got some reading for you guys to do. This is not in our library. Go home, read Common Sense. It's 37 pages. Maybe you'll get some Common Sense. <laughs> this, I got this for like $6 or something. It's called The Inaugural Addresses of the President. Start in the beginning. It's the best history course you will ever take. Because in the inaugural addresses, the presidents are always talking about what's important to the country. That's called uh, first person history, primary source. But here are some things that were said early in our nation that I would call to mind as we kind of wind down here. John Adams, the second president of the United States, says our const Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. You see, rights, blessing, grace comes from God. It's not a man-made thing. This is Thomas Jefferson. And you could go through all of the early inaugurals and you'll find speech like this. Jefferson. I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our fathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a land flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life, who has covered our national infancy with his providence and our riper years with his wisdom and power. And to whose goodness I ask you to join in supplication with me. Many years later, Lincoln, on the eve of the Civil War, in his first inaugural, said, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him who has never yet forsaken this favored land are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. Even if we make bad choices if we seek the Lord. He will not forsake us. One last thing. James Madison was president after Jefferson. This is not from his inaugural. This is something called the Memorial and Remonstrance. It's the precursor to the uh, Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, uh, which is the basically the precursor to the uh, free exercise clause in uh, the Constitution. Madison, of course, was one of the primary authors of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. There is a little park uh, on Route 20, a little bit north of Orange, where all of our children uh, in their early years grew up, where I was pastoring in Orange County. Uh, in those days, there's a little park it's called the Leland Madison Park. Leland, Madison was at the edge of the county at a place called Montpelier. And he was traveling up to the Constitutional Convention. He was met by a Baptist pastor named, uh, I don't know, remember his first name, his last name was Leland. A lot of Baptists had been imprisoned for preaching the gospel in Virginia before the Statute of Religious Freedom. And uh, there was a question of whether the Constitution would be, would be uh, ratified in Virginia. 
without a Bill of Rights. In fact, in a number of the colonies, that was so. And in this little park, you will read that there was a meeting between this Baptist pastor whose co-workers had been imprisoned, at least jailed for a period of time. He met with Madison and he said, you need to put into this constitution a right to the free exercise of religion. It is considered to be a very profound and significant meeting that happened in Madison's preparation as he went up to the convention and as they prepared the Bill of Rights. It's marked by this tiny little park on Route 20. You'll drive right by it unless you're looking for it. But if you look up, if you look it up on the uh, information superhighway on the net, you'll find out a lot about it. Here's what Madison had written before that, and I want us to keep this in mind as we close. We hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction and conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. Before any man can be considered a member of civil society, he must be considered as a subject of the creator of the universe. Samuel, we want a king. You can have a king, but you need to understand you are first and foremost a subject of the creator of the universe. That understanding has been passed down to us. It is part of the warp and woof of the nation in which we live. It is forgotten. It is covered up. It is not seen. It is not acknowledged. But it is there. My prayer is that we will not want to be like all the nations, but that we will want to be individuals, families, and a nation not under a monarch, but under God. And when we embrace our rights, privileges, duties, and freedoms that come from God, we will enjoy rich and full blessing indeed. God is both demanding and gracious in our rebellion. The next time you and I just insist on having our own way, our own outcome. It could be in a relationship or a circumstance, a job. Let us understand that we relate first and foremost to Christ. We search his word. We await his outcome and we trust in his grace. Accept his grace and trust in his sovereignty because he is for you. He is not against you. Even while we were sinners. He died for us. May it never be that we would sin against one another by ceasing to pray for one another or ceasing to pray for our nation. We're going to sing a hymn in closing. It acknowledges the sovereignty of God over the past, the present, and the future. Let's stand together and pray. Father, you are great. You are the God of all the nations of the world. We live in a nation that has been peculiarly blessed with revelation of your ways. And we're in danger of losing that, Lord, in many ways. Thank you for the freedom to proclaim what I've proclaimed today, to declare it openly. And I pray our hearts would understand that you are demanding, but you are also gracious to us in our rebellion and that we would understand that we worship God and we are grateful for government. In Jesus' name, amen.